2 Corinthians chapter <coughs> number 5. We'll begin reading in verse number 1 there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. For we know, well, it's glad to know some, we're glad that we can know some things. Amen? Yep. Amen. We live in a world of uncertainty. I'm glad there's some things we can know. Amen. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now this earthly house is not talking about the new mansion in heaven. It's talking about your body here. <clears throat> it goes on to tell you, verse 2, For in this we groan. You ever groan in your body? Yeah. Earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. It's talking about your new body. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, says it again, groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, for we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. <clears throat> People accuse Paul of being beside himself, in other words, crazy. He says, well, it's to God. For whether we be sober, it is for your call. Verse 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're, then we're, all, we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. <clears throat> Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God, was, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now that we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for each one here today. 
Pray you'd save that lost soul that might be in the congregation. Pray that you would strengthen and encourage your people. God, help us to be exactly what you want us to be in these last days. God, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And amen. Amen. We read the chapter here, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, all 21 verses of Scripture here in 2 Corinthians 5. And the reason I read the whole chapter is because I want to bring a message from this chapter, uh, some motivations for serving Christ. Some motivations for serving Christ. And uh, give you about, oh, give you four C's this morning. Uh, the points begin the letter C. I want us to look at the constraint, the condition, the cross, and the closing. And uh, four different things here. Uh, first of all, notice the constraint of his love. I want to say the constraint of his love conquers me. The constraint of his love conquers me. Notice in verse 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us. You know what Paul's saying there? He's saying the love that Christ manifested on the cross of Calvary, it constrains me. It compels me. It, 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 it kind of stirs me up inside and it makes me want to do something for God. The constraint of his love conquers me. In verse 14, his love conquered me in four different areas, in salvation, in separation, surrender, and service. His love conquered me, first of all, in salvation. You say, what do you mean? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, John 3, 16. 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. Amen. Amen. Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yeah. While we were yet sinners. The constraint of his love conquers me. His love conquered me in salvation. I mean, I didn't want nothing to do with God, but he came after me, convicted me, dealt with my heart, and thank God I called upon his name and I got saved. Amen. Amen. His love conquered me in salvation. His love conquered me in separation. <clears throat> in other words, it makes me want to be different. A Christian ought to look a little different. He ought to act a little different. A lot different than the world does. I ought to be separated. Wherefore, come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord. 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Paul said in Titus 2, 11 and 12, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. And so his love conquered me in separation, in salvation, in surrender, in surrender. Galatians 2.20, I'm glad that God so loved the world. But you know what? He loved me, you and I personally. Yeah. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Two me's in Galatians 2.20. That gets very personal. Amen? Yeah. I thank God for that. Uh, his love conquered me in surrender. So he, he gave his life for me. I want to give my life for him and serve him. And be what he wants me to be. So the constraint of his love conquers me. His love conquered me in salvation, in separation, in surrender, and fourthly, in service. In service. And the verse is right here in the chapter, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth me. Constraineth us. Paul saying the love of Jesus Christ manifested on the cross of Calvary constrains me, compels me, urges me, and woos me on to do something for the glory of God in service. The constraint of his love conquers me. Number two, the condition of the lost concerns me. Number one, the constraint of his love conquers me. But number two, the condition of the lost concerns me. You 
You say, where's that at? Verse 14 again in the chapter. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, here it is, that if one died for all, then we're all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. You see, this is the motivation for serving Jesus Christ. The condition of the lost concerns me. Let me give you four D's about the lost. Number one, they have a deceitful heart. A deceitful heart. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. I got thinking about that verse. The heart is deceitful, and listen to this, above all things. Hmm. That's pretty deceitful. Yeah. It's deceitful above all things. There's a lot of deceitful things. But the heart, the human heart and mankind we're born with when we're born of our mother's womb is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? He said, I, the Lord, search the heart. They have a deceitful heart. Secondly, they have a darkened mind. A darkened mind. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. They have a darkened mind mind. They have a deceitful heart. Thirdly, they have a dying body. You say, well, we're all dying, preacher. I know. But unsaved people don't even realize they have a dying body. Every single day that you live, you're dying. Yeah. Yeah. You're, we're a dying people. We're dying. I, told, I heard a, a, guy, a guy told me Somebody told me after I was diagnosed with diabetes, and I had talk, and I ran to so many people that had diabetes. I had several people tell me they say, "Well, basically what you do is you just die a slow, lingering death." I said, "What?" <laughs> they said, "Yeah, when you have diabetes, it's just, you're, it's just killing you every day." But there's people that have got diabetes that live up in their 80s and 90s. Oh yeah. So we got people here in the church. Well, praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for that, <laughs> Sister Dottie said. Amen. So we have a dying body. I mean, every single day we're dying. We get older every day, every week, every month, every year. You know that. We all know that. We have a dying body. That's what all these, all these television programs are all about. It's how to get Botox and how to get your, get your lips and your nose and everything, and get your cheeks and everything stretched out and so you can look younger and your eyes and, and uh, facelift and all this stuff, you know, and your body and all these things done to your body. You know why? Because people want to look younger. Because they don't want to get older. They don't want to die. It's human nature. Nobody who wants to die. Right? The strongest drive in a human being, the strongest drive in a human being is self-preservation. Keeping yourself alive. They'll get a face look when they go to the funeral. That's right. That's right. They've got a dying body. They've got a darkened mind. They have a deceitful heart. And fourthly, they are dead spiritually. They are dead spiritually. Ephesians 2, 1, and you have the quickened who were dead in trespass and sin. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you what. I look back before I got saved. I'm telling you what. I was as blind as a bat backing up backwards. I mean, I was so blind and ignorant of spiritual things. And so were you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Paul said he did it ignorantly in unbelief, talking about persecuting the Christians there in 1 Timothy 1. He talked about before he got saved. He said, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. The condition of the lost concerns me. Folks, your lost relatives and neighbors and people that you work with, people you go to school with, they're going to die and go to hell if they don't get saved. I'm going to say, number one, the constraint of his love conquers me. The condition of the lost concerns me. And then thirdly, the cross of the Lord calls me. The cross of the Lord calls me. Verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, who's that ministry of reconciliation given to? The pastors, the preachers, the missionaries, the deacons, the evangelists? Yes, but not just them. Every person that's been made a new creature in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Verse 17. That's male, female. Everybody has the ministry of reconciling people to God. Verse 19. To wit, in other words, that is, that God was in Christ. You know when Jesus Christ walked around this earth 2,000 years ago? That was God manifest in the flesh. Amen. That's why you can tell the Pharisees in John 8 when they were making a big deal about Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all that going clear back to their history and so forth and, and making a big deal about it, acting real proud and arrogant about it. Jesus said in John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's people that are jealous of Jesus Christ. The, the Pharisees were jealous of him. For he knew, Pilate knew that for envy they had delivered him. Imagine a man walking around this earth that never committed a sin. That would put you under conviction. That, that would kind of make you kind of not like him to begin with because you know you're a sinful being. And then every, every word he said it put you under conviction, basically. And he looked at you and he knew everything about you. <clears throat> Verse 20, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. <clears throat> As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he, he, God, hath made him, Jesus, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You know how you get the righteousness of God? Except in Christ. Christ is the righteousness of God. Number three, the cross of the Lord calls me. Now let's look at three things here. The cross ministry of the Savior was to die, the cross ministry of the saint is to declare, and the cross ministry to the sinner is to deliver. All right, the third point is the cross of the Lord calls me. A, the cross ministry of the Savior was to die. Verse 21, I just read it. It was a ministry of suffering, of suffering. Verse 21, for he hath made him, he hath made him, Look at that. A ministry of suffering. I mean, you read the gospel. You know, I'll tell you what. You ever get discouraged and depressed and get down in the dumps and get feeling sorry for yourself, which sometimes we do as Christians. Go to the four gospels, or at least one or two of them, and read the cruci just the crucifixion accounts where Jesus Christ was murdered. How they lied about him. How that he could have killed every one of them right on the spot if he wanted to. Yeah. But he didn't. He did. A ministry of suffering. Now, I'm going to tell you something, folks. I can preach an hour on every one of these things here, but you're going to, there's suffering. You, most of you know that. In the Christian life, there's suffering. There's times of bereavement. We lose loved ones to death. You might lose your job, might lose your health. You might lose your spouse, a child. I mean, there's suffering in the Christian life. For unto you is given the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Philippians 1.29. So the cross ministry of the Savior was to die. It was a ministry of suffering. And secondly, it was a ministry of sacrifice. For, God, for he hath made him to be sin. To be sin is the sacrifice. God made him is the suffering. For he hath made him, that's suffering, to be sin, that's sacrifice. He knew no sin. He committed no sin. He did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth. 1 Peter 2.22. There's a ministry of sacrifice. Not only is there in Christian life sometimes suffering, but there's sacrifices. 
You know what? I'm not trying to be smart like that. A lot of people don't want to serve God because they know they're going to have to sacrifice. God might call them to sacrifice a little bit of something. Not just money, but sacrifice your time. Sacrifice your abilities, your talents. Sacrifice some material possessions or things or whatever it might be. It could be a thousand things. And people don't want to do that. So they just... Uh, and when they get to judgment, God will go, eh. hmm. A ministry of sacrifice to be sin. And then a ministry of substitution is to be sin for us. For us is the substitution. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him is a ministry of suffering. To be sin is a ministry of sacrifice. For us is a ministry of substitution. Well, I'm glad he took my place. Amen. 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 He took our place on the cross of Calvary. So you and I don't have to burn in hell. Amen. Amen. And so that's why when a person says, I don't want you, Jesus. I won't accept you, Jesus. It's a free gift. They don't have to do anything. You just got to accept it. You know why they don't? Because of pride. That pride will damn their soul in hell. Yeah. Yeah. No questions asked. Because they, they're they willing to say, I thank you for doing what you did on the cross and you got beaten beyond recognition. You got like a bloody massacre and you did it voluntarily and all that. I, that's I good. That's, I'm wonderful. I'm glad you did it. But I, I think I'm a pretty good person. I think I can do it. And they can't do it. They die and they burn in hell forever. What a terrible thing. I'll tell you what, I know I know you folks probably get tired of me saying this, but I don't know what it is the past year, ever since I read that message and read that Charles Spurgeon said that the hell of hell is the fact that it's for eternity. I can't get it out of my head. Because I think about people who have died and probably went to hell and they'll never be able to get out. And then I think, I look at people today, I know some, I've got loved ones, relatives, family members, that are not saved, and I know that most of them will probably die and split hell wide open. I pray they don't. But they'll never be able to get out. And when you look at eternity, when you look at everything in the light of eternity, and people dying and going to hell, there isn't a whole lot in this world that means a whole lot. To be honest with you. You say, well, it means a whole lot to me. I love the world, preacher. Go ahead, help yourself. Go at it, man. Go at it. A ministry of substitution for us. For he hath made him to be sin for us. For us. Uh, the ministry of reconciliation includes repentance and works to prove repentance is genuine. Think about that. <clears throat> he hath made him to be sin for us. For us. And he is a propitiation. Propitiation is a payment. He is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Yeah. The whole world. Not just the elect. <clears throat> First John 2, verse 2. God so loved the world. Amen. He wants everybody to get saved. Amen. The, the cross of the Lord calls me. Third point. A, the cross ministry of the Savior was to die in verse 21. It's a ministry of suffering. God made him a ministry of sacrifice to be sin, a ministry of substitution for us. And then B, not only the cross ministry of the Savior, but the cross ministry of the saint is to declare. To declare. In verses 18 to 20, He's given us the word of reconciliation. We have the ministry of reconciliation. We read the verses, verse 18, 19, and 20. 
We see the word, the wonder of reconciliation in verse 18. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. When you got saved, you were reconciled back to God. Yep. Before you got saved, you were away from God. You were the enemy of God. But then you got born again and God, uh, he brought you to the Lord. I think of the verse just come to my mind. Uh, let's see, uh, First Peter. Uh, let me read this for you. Uh, I just thought of it. First Peter three eighteen says, "For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. The just, he's the just, and we're the unjust, that he might bring us to God." See, when you were lost, you weren't brought to God. You were alienated from God. You were away from God. But when you got saved, you were reconciled back to God. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. 1 Peter 3.18 The wonder of reconciliation. Verse 18, 2 Corinthians 5.18 The word of reconciliation. The end of verse 19, I have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Folks, you and I have the greatest words in the world, the greatest message in the world. The gospel. That's why we got these gospel tracts. Why do you think Fellowship Track League is over here putting out millions and billions of tracts every several years? Why do you think God why do you think God's raised up these track distribution places all over the country? Fellowship Track League and several others, and printing printing Bibles, all this. People, people, a lot of Christians just take it for granted. They guess, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a gospel track, yeah. yeah the Bible, yeah. give him a Bible, yeah. yeah. It's got the most powerful words on it that man's ever seen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So what do you mean? What's so powerful in it? It's got the gospel. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4.12. Amen. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Paul said, for it is the power of God unto salvation. That's why the devil wants you to keep your mouth shut about the gospel. That's why I don't want you to pass out no gospel tracts. You don't even have to talk to anybody if you don't want to. Just take you some gospel tracts. When you go to Walmart, put one in the restroom stall. Put one on the, the uh, sink there. Brother Spurlock was telling me the other day on the phone, years ago, he had a guy in his church. This guy, he said, This guy, Brother Kogel, he said he witnessed to a tree. I mean, this guy, he, he witnessed everybody. He passed out tracks. He said he's very zealous. He said that sometimes he got a little bit too fanatical. He said, he, I think it's Kroger or something. Yeah, I think it was Kroger. Yeah. Kroger? And he put. He put gospel tracts down. He went to the beer section there. And he put gospel tracts down in the 12 packs and the 24 packs of beer. And somebody called in about it or something. I forget what the deal was. They got it had the Spurlock's name and church phone number and everything on it. And uh, Bill, uh, who worked for Channel 3, uh, Tony, uh, Channel, Bill, uh, he don't work there no more. Kind of a nice looking guy. Bill Murray. Murray. Bill Murray called up Brother Spurlock one day at the church. He was there at church. He called him up and said, he said, I'd like to interview you. He said, never interview me for what? He goes, well, the, uh, the uh, argument they're having over uh, you uh, putting your church people, putting gospel tracts in the beer uh, things there in Kroger. He said, what are you talking about? Brother called it in about. <laughs> so he goes, no, he said, I'm not meeting with you people because you don't put the whole sentences and the whole words, everything I say, you delete out. I mean, they can, those television stations, they cut out whatever they want to cut out. Yeah. And uh, and he said, I'm not meeting with you. Bill Murray called him two or three times. They ended up having some kind of a meeting without Brother Spurlock, I think, or something. I don't know. I, he was telling me about the whole deal. It was a big... But, but he said, this guy, just, he, went, he wanted to witness to everybody, man. He wanted to put gospel tracts in everything. you got to use a little wisdom sometimes. But uh, the wonder of reconciliation... The word of reconciliation, 
And the work of reconciliation is the Great Commission. God's given us the work, the ministry of reconciliation. Every Christian, male, female, young or old, everybody <coughs> has a responsibility to get the gospel out. Let me move along here quick. Then thirdly, the cross ministry to the sinner is to deliver. To deliver. Verse 17 says, If any man, therefore if any man, that's the person, <coughs> be in Christ, that's the position, you're in Christ, that's your position. Not only you in Christ, but Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1.27. So the person, if any man, the position be in Christ, and then he is a new creature, that's the product. Product is when you're in Christ, you're a new creature, and uh, that's, a, that's a product. And then the procedure, old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Isn't that wonderful? Now let me say something about uh, all things. All things does not mean that every single aspect of a Christian life has changed. A man may like iced tea and go and go and likes to go fishing uh, before he got saved and after salvation, just as he did before he got saved. Nor does it mean that the Adamic nature is eradicated. A Christian can still succumb to bad habits and heinous sins. All things, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Uh, behold, uh, Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things refers to the new way a Christian has of looking at things. When you get saved, you have a new man inside of you. Paul talked about the new man in Ephesians 4.24. That, that new man looks at everything differently than the Adamic nature does. Your attitude towards things is changed. The important thing is that if you are a new creature, then live like a new creature. So when it says all things, it doesn't mean, well, I mean, did you go fishing before you got saved? Some people still go fishing after they're saved, so it didn't change. Did you eat before you got saved? You still eat after you get saved. See, when it says all things, don't mean every single thing in your life changed. It means you look at things differently. In other words, before I got saved, I didn't go to church. I didn't read my Bible. I didn't pray. I didn't talk about God. I didn't want nothing to do with God, spiritual things. But old things are passed away, but all things become new. And then, oh, I'm not going to tell you all the things I did before I got saved, but now I don't do those things now that I'm saved. That's what he's talking about. He don't mean every single thing that you used to do, you no longer do. Well, you got to quit eating. You have to quit. You got to use your head when you read the Bible. The procedure. And then, uh, last of all, I want to say this the closing of my life confronts me. In verses 9 to 11, 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to 11, he talks about the judgment seat of Christ. And uh, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, there, he, uh, the judgment seat will be a day of perfect attendance. Every Christian's going to be there. Per personal accounting, painful answering, and personal awarding of crowns and rewards. The closing of my life confronts me. Uh, look at my absence, my absence, my appearing, and my accounting. In verse 9, 2 Corinthians 5, 9, whether we labor, wherefore we labor, that whether present, we don't labor to get to heaven. He's not talking about that. People use these verses to teach that. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent. In other words, whether we're with the Lord or whether we're still in this world. Whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Not accepted of him in the sense of, see, people say, people believe you can lose your salvation. See there, brother? We just hope we're accepted of him. We labor. We work. We have good works. We're trying to get to heaven by good works. See how people pervert that scripture? To teach, A, salvation by works, and B, you don't know for sure you're saved because you may, you may be accepted of him. You got a nice way of perverting the scriptures, honey? It's not even talking about that. It's talking about saved people working because they got to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Whether they go to heaven or hell, that was determined when they got saved. See how people get their Bible all fouled up? Churches all over Hillsborough, all over Highland County, believe that, what I just said. All over the country. Verse 9, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. Accepted of him in what? 
In other words, he'll be pleased with us. Because he goes on to tell you, verse 10, for we must all appear before the Highland County Court of Appeals. Is that what it says? <clears throat> or we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone, every Christian, may receive the things done in his body according to what he hath done, whether it be good or bad. See that? Verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now listen, I believe he's talking there about, he could be including unsaved people about getting saved with the terror of the Lord. But he's talking in the context about the judgment seat of Christ. This ought to scare you and I half to death. Mm. You see that? People try to say verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Oh yeah, brother, we've got to tell unsaved people. Yeah, you need to get saved because the terror of the Lord's going to be upon them. Yeah, but what about you Christians? See, Christians a lot of times try to take every verse and apply it to the laws. Get out of here. No, us. Us. Verse 11 Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. And whose consciences? The church at Corinth. He's talking right in Corinthians. He's talking about judgment seat of Christ, saved people. And in the context, he says, knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men what? Persuade them to live right, and do right, and act right, and talk right. Do what's right. Obey God. Live for God. Because you're going to stand before God for the way you lived in this life. Yeah. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. I believe he's talking about persuading unsaved people to get saved, but I also don't just confine it to that verse to lost people. He's also talking about saved people. What? Getting saved? No, they're already saved. But saved people living for God. Do you know how many people in America are saved? Born again. And aren't serving the Lord. You'd fall over dead in your padded pew right there if you knew. Who knows? Who, who really knows the number? God does. He can tell you how many exactly that there are. God can tell you and I how many born-again Christians there are just in America. I mean, he can tell us how many there are in the world. But we'll just confine it to America. God can tell you and I in a heartbeat how many born-again Christians, first of all, how many born-again Christians there are in the country then he can tell you how many there are that are actually really serving the Lord. We don't mean perfection. No, but no, none of us are perfect. We're not talking about being perfect. We're just serving the Lord. Reasonable service. Closing of my life confronts me. My absence, absence from the body, present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, in other words, you're living in this body, you're, we're absent from the Lord. In other words, you're not with the Lord. Verse 8, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body, that's your death, and to be present with the Lord. So there's my absence, my appearance in verse 10. We must all appear. And my accounting at the end of verse 10, that everyone may give, receive the things done in his body according to he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So you have my absence, my appearance, and my accounting. The judgment seat of Christ, as I said a few minutes ago, will be a day of perfect attendance. We must all appear. Perfect attendance. No Christian is going to be able to say, hey, Lord, I'll be there in about half an hour. 
Can I, I'm gonna stop by and get me something to eat. I'll be there. At the, I'll be at the judgment seat in just a little bit. I gotta get a, one of the tires on my car is flat. I gotta get some air in the tire, or I'll be there in a minute. Lord, I'm sick today. Can I appear tomorrow? <laughs> the judgment seat will be a day of perfect attendance. Personal accounting. According to he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Painful answering. See the tears? He said, I thought there was no tears in heaven. What, what are you talking about all this stuff in the judgment seat? The tears aren't wiped away. We went over this in our first by first study in Revelation. Seems like a hundred years ago, but the tears aren't wiped away till after the judgment seat of Christ in Revelation 7:17. 7, until after the great white throne judgment in Revelation 21, 4. Revelation 20, 11 to 15, I saw a great white throne, John said. That's the great white throne judgment. In the next chapter, 21, 4, it's God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. But it doesn't happen until after the great white throne judgment and after the judgment seat of Christ, two separate judgments separated by a thousand years. Judgment seat, after we're raptured, the judgment seat of Christ will take place. He said, God's going to have time to millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of Christians stand for the judgment seat of Christ. God's going to have time to do all that. God has all the time to do whatever he wants to do. He can take as long as he wants to. So after the, after the rapture, the judgment seat of Christ, and then we're, we're, going, to come, we're going to come down with him. At the, uh, we're going to come down with the Lord in Revelation 19. Revelation 20, 11 and 15 is a great white throne judgment. In Revelation 21, 4, he wipes away all tears. The judgment seat of Christ is a great white throne judgment. Two separate judgments for two different kinds of people. Not trying to be mean, not trying to be a smart aleck, but 90% of the churches in Highland County do not know this when I'm telling you right now. They think, be good and do good, brother. And you'll come up with the general resurrection, the general judgment. If your good works outweigh your bad works, you'll make it. If they don't, you'll go to hell. Well, we don't believe in hell, so you'll go somewhere. But there's two separate judgments separated by a thousand years. Judgment seat and great white throne for two different kinds of people. People don't know that because they don't rightly divide the word truth. They combobulate all the scripture together in one big smorgasbord. They don't rightly divide the word truth. Therefore, they don't have their doctrine right. Painful answering. And then last of all, personal awarding, thank God. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to he hath done, whether it be good or Bad, verse 10. The end of verse 10. Good. You done good? It would be a personal award. Paul said, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Some motivations for serving Christ. Number one, the constraint of his love conquers me in verse 14. The love of Christ constraineth us. His love that he manifests on the cross of Calvary, he's Paul said, just does something in my heart. His love conquered me, he said, in salvation, in separation, in surrender, and in service. <coughs> Number two, the condition of the lost concerns me. The end of verse 14. And several other verses in the chapter. I brought out the fact they have a deceitful heart. They have a darkened mind. They have a dying body. And they are dead spiritually. Number three, the cross of the Lord calls me in verse 17 to 21. The cross ministry of the Lord is to die in verse 21. It's a ministry of suffering. God made him. The ministry of sacrifice to be sin. Ministry of substitution for us. And then at, uh, at the cross ministry of the Savior, then the cross ministry of the saint is to declare, tell people, <clears throat> verse 18 to 20, 
The wonder of reconciliation in verse 18, the word of reconciliation, verse 19, and the work of reconciliation, verse 18 to 20. The Great Commission. Folks, the last thing Christ says before he leaves this earth. Think of it. He could have said a lot of things. He could have talked about a lot of things. He's getting ready to ascend up and leave his disciples. Now, fellas, I'm going to tell you how to build the largest church in Jerusalem. No. Fellas, I'm going to, tell you how, I'm going to show you how to preach or teach the Word of God. No. I'm going to show you how to sing. No. I'm going to show you how to build the largest Christian school in America. No, he didn't say that. I'm going to show you how to do this or that. No. But ye shall receive power, Acts 1.8. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. Both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men, angels, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Amen. This same Jesus, not a spirit, not a ghost, same Jesus. He's coming back. Amen. 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 Let's live for the Lord. Amen. Some motivations for serving Jesus Christ. Let's stand if you would.